Hello and welcome back. Yesterday I took you through a brief introduction to cryptocurrencies and kind of talked about kind of where we were at as far as the um, setting the groundwork for getting the stage set for using Bitcoin. And so we looked at kind of a, a few projects. We looked at D DigiCash, we looked at PayPal, we looked at eGold. We kind of talked about the nuances of each of those. We talked about some of the value that was uh, derived from each of those products, projects and why some of them failed. Uh, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at Bitcoin uh, specifically. And we're going to look at Bitcoin's approach to kind of fixing uh, the ability for us to transfer value in a trustless environment and to do that in a distributed manner so that uh, any type of central authority wouldn't be able to be taken down either from a hacker or a government or something like that. So we don't have uh, really a central um, uh, point of failure and so that's what we're going to look to fix. So that's what we'll be talking about. Um, as we go through this, uh, we're going to have a few topics we're going to talk about. I'm going to introduce you to Bitcoin. We're going to review uh, the white paper. I'm going to take a look at the, the, the uh, Satoshi white paper with you real quickly. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, but I want to show you basically just how simple it is and how easy it is to follow. Um, I want to talk about the first implementation of a blockchain, which of course is uh, Bitcoin, and we want to uh, kind of do that as we talk about that white paper. I want to talk about how, uh, how Finney and Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, to the two initial miners that were on the Bitcoin network uh, and kind of where they came from and um, some of the uh, history of them and what they were doing in the uh, beginning. Uh, with that, we want to look at some blocks and actually see what it actually was that they're doing and why it's so important because it's this big mystique and it's like this magic. And, and you know, I think that probably the name of the company uh, that I'm establishing for, uh, or my, my consulting company is going to be um, No Magic, Just Logic. So uh, I want to show you the logic behind the blockchain magic. That's basically what I'm trying to do. Um, so anyway, I've been thinking about that for a while. All right. So, um, so anyway... Uh, welcome to the first training session for No Magic, Just Logic. All right, so anyway, it's going to be high level. I don't want to get too terribly technical for you, uh, but I do want to get technical enough to allow you to understand really what's going on and really to see the nuts and bolts. Um, all right, so anyway, so we're going to show you how mining works. I'm going to take you into some mining and sh uh, some, some block explorers and kind of take a look at some blocks and some transactions and discuss kind of what's going on there. Um, <clears throat> We're going to also spend a, quite a bit of time talking about Bitcoin and how the valuation of Bitcoin has fluctuated over time and how it provides a massive amount of liquidity, why that liquidity is there, some of the things that caused it to see such a massive amount of flux, and um, why we can kind of trust what's going on there. Um, and then uh, once we've done that, uh, I also want to talk about uh, Silk Road. Uh, so, so we're going to talk about like the Bitcoin pizza day. I want to talk about the Mac, Mount Gox debacle. Um, and I want to address those because usually anytime somebody talks about Bitcoin, they always want to cite those and they want to cite those for the reasons that um, we all see as, as um, a problem. Uh, but we also want to not allow our morality to get in the way of innovation. So uh, we want to kind of discuss that a little bit and kind of talk about what that means and how that can, can affect us. Um, and then lastly, I want to kind of discuss who exactly was Satoshi Nakamoto, who are the usual suspects, um, who are the people that have been uh, kind of uh, pointed fingers at to think that they were the Satoshi, or maybe that they've claimed that they are Satoshi. Uh, and so we'll take a look at some of the usual suspects and kind of give that a little bit of a background. And hopefully this will be a fun little exercise. But my goal is, or my target audience, is really someone with a semi-technical background or a semi-understanding of what um, this technology is intended to do. And uh, we want to kind of help you have a better understanding of why it works. And so that's really the importance. And I think that once people can get a better understanding of that, it'll be easier for them to recognize where they have problems within their own environment, that this technology might be able to help them fix those problems. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, if you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Tommy Cooksey. I am an independent trainer. Um, I've been doing training for quite some time, blockchain training for about a year now. Um, 
uh, through my meetups and also through my former employer. Uh, as an independent trainer, I um, currently uh, have no employers, so if you uh, would like to give me any donations, there's my Ethereum address that I take donations for uh, this free training that I provide to you. Um, there's my email address as well if you'd like to reach out to me uh, for any training engagements or if you'd just like for me to speak to your meetup, I would be happy to do so. Um, please reach out to me anytime, any place. I would love to come talk to you. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, you know, as I kind of mentioned before, a little bit about Satoshi Nakamoto. This was the author or the pseudo author of the Bitcoin white paper. Uh, this white paper dropped on October 31st or Halloween of 2008. Um, and it basically just went out to an email list of academics. That list was a lot of cryptographers. Um, and basically uh, what it did is it was, uh, was well received by the community. It was elegant. Um, it was good enough fix to that Byzantine general problem that we talked about yesterday. So it was a fix that allowed us to have basically trust in a trustless environment through messaging uh, by sharing messaging. And so I really want to make this quite simple. In essence, what we need, what we had yesterday is, is we found that if we stored a, a ledger, so let's kind of explain what a ledger is versus a database. Because when we think about a database, uh, a database means that you are going to actually have data stored. Oops, let's go back. Uh, a database means that you're going to actually have data stored in a create, read, update, and delete location. That means that you can do updates to that data and you can delete that data. In a blockchain, the data is in a ledger, much like what you would see on your bank account, where when you look at the inputs or the, 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 the values you put in and the values you take out, it, the math has to uh, always reconcile. And so the interesting thing that happens is, is that on um, a ledger, what we have is we have credits and debits like you would normally have. And then you also have a signature that then represents the, um, uh, the ability for someone to change the values that were in a particular account. And so the signature represents the ability to change the value. And so what this did, there's this, uh, this distributed ledger, basically said, I'm going to keep a ledger of everything that's going on and all the financial tra transactions that are going on, and I'm going to share it with everybody in the network. And everybody in the network is going to be able to see everything that's on everybody's network. And by the way, they're all going to check each other's work. And by doing this, this elegant method allowed us to ensure that we didn't have a bad actor. And if we did have a bad actor, we could easily identify them. And so, um, in essence, that's what this paper did for us. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. If we uh, click on this little link here, I'll bring me open to the Satoshi white paper. If you uh, do a search on Google, I'm sure you can find it. But the interesting thing that you'll see here is that Satoshi didn't call this I mean, he did call it Bitcoin, but his, his, his subtitle for this paper was it's a peer-to-peer -peer electric cash system. So in essence, the goal is, is to get me to be able to send my money, much like I can send my email, to anyone in the world, anytime, any place, electronically, without having to go through a bank or a middleman. And so that's purely kind of what this is trying to do. And I encourage you to come out here and read this. But it talks about this here in the introduction, and then he gets into kind of where these transactions occur. And so this is what I was talking about earlier, is, is when you define a transaction, that means that there are going to be a set of Bitcoin that I am going to take my Bitcoin and give to you. Well, if I'm going to give something from me to you out of my bank account, normally I would have to sign a check. It's very much like signing a check, I would just have to sign a transaction, and then that transaction is going to verify that I own those Bitcoin and they can be sent to you. Once I verify that, those Bitcoin now belong to you in your address, and you would have to use your signature then in order to send them to someone else. The interesting thing about Bitcoin though, is if you have a certain set of inputs, it has to, re it has to be equal to the outputs. 
the inputs have to always equal the outputs when you deal with transactions, and that's kind of what they're showing us here. And we'll talk more about that as we kind of go through and get a little bit more technical on some of this stuff, but I just wanna introduce this to, stuff to you. And another thing that we're seeing here is in this solution, it also adds a timestamp. And so the timestamp gives us the ability to prove the state of data at a particular point in time. That's very important. And so with that timestamp, then we can prove that this was the state uh, of, of something. And all of this consensus that we're dealing with, and so if you're not familiar with the term consensus, that simply means that we are um, creating some type of agreement throughout the network that something is true or something is right. And we use this consensus method called proof of work, which is in essence a big math problem. And the computers have to solve this math problem. And when they've solved the math problem, they then show that they've solved that problem. Once they've done that, then they have to broadcast this to the rest of the network. Once the rest of the network agrees that that's a good block, that that block looks good, they can go ahead and put that block into the blockchain. And I'm gonna talk more about that here in just a little bit. And so that's the network. And then once you've mined a block as a, uh, as a miner, you will get an incentive. Uh, the way that the incentive mechanism is set up, uh, the incentive started out with 50 Bitcoin being issued to every miner that was able to issue a block. Um, and so the miners were able to issue blocks based on um, being able to solve that math problem and then showing the proof of their work. And so um, then once they've, uh, once they've verified that they've done that, then they can go ahead and uh, um, get the uh, block reward, which in essence is called the Coinbase, not to be confused with the exchange Coinbase, but it's called the Coinbase for that block reward. And then so any transactions uh, from that uh, set of 50, 25, 12.5, uh, whatever we're at currently, uh, that Coinbase would then be used to track all transactions back to zero. So on the ledger, that's how we reconcile uh, all transactions. And so um, when we verify transactions, this is how that works. It uses this thing called the Merkle root. And we'll go through, and um, I want to—I don't want to get too terribly into this. I will talk more about this uh, in, in just a little bit. I'll go into some of the more details on how um, the SHA-256 algorithm works. And I think I might do that in some later uh, course material. But in this one, I really want to just keep this kind of middle of the road or, or high level as far as technical. Don't want to get too terribly technical on this one. Um, but I did want to kind of just give you guys kind of a general understanding of how that mining actually works. So in essence, again, all these miners are doing is just simply trying to create a block that meets the math requirements. That's it, that's all they're trying to do. So keep that in mind as we kind of go through this section. And I'll keep this, uh, I'll keep this white paper open because we might come back and reference it a little bit. But anyway, the important thing to take away from this is as these academics started to look at this problem or started to look at this white paper, they were like, holy cow, man, this works because it's doing a lot of the things that we thought that we should be able to do uh, with the distributed electronic cash system um, or cryptocurrencies uh, or digital currencies, uh, but we found we ran into problems. We needed some de decentralization. So we finally now have the really the primary use case of Bitcoin is decentralized money. That was really the ultimate purpose of it, and that's what we saw a peer-to-peer -peer cash system. Another thing that's kind of important to note, and we'll talk about this as towards the end of this lecture, is that we can't find the finder. F excuse me, we can't find the founder. Satoshi Nakamoto is really a pseudo person, can't be found. There's a lot of usual suspects, and I'll talk about those. But in essence, there's really not one person or one even one individual that can be um, held responsible. It's kind of a group effort. And, and, and once we can prove that the technology works, then it just works, right? And that's what we have. So um, there's value in having a currency that you can control and can be abused by a corrupt government that can't be abused by a corrupt government or maybe a central authority. And, and you know, we talked about e-gold yesterday, but, you know, that, that happened in Greece. Uh, it happened in Cyprus. 
Uh, we see it happening in Turkey. Um, I'm sure it happens in a lot of countries where there's, there's millions and millions of people that are being suppressed and they're having problems and they need to be banked. They need to be able to store value in some type of a of, a, of an encryptable location where they can't have it beaten out of them or you know something like that they can they can travel um, you know across borders uh, and and still um, be able to maintain that value once they can get reconnected to the network um, you know those are some things you know banking individuals that really don't have the ability to bank themselves right now those are really some of the the push um, the things that really push this technology to really help individuals and giving people anonymity uh, in their transactions so that uh, they can um, you know they can spend their money as they wish and and, and there's a lot to be said for that and so um, yes do you still need to pay taxes absolutely yes are you still responsible for the things around you absolutely uh, as an American I 100% believe in paying into the system to get back what you can get out of the system uh, because our system is the best system in the world but you know, when we think about these foreign countries or some of these people that are be that are trapped in, in situations uh, with whatever um, you know rule that they're under, uh, I've always believed that the the circumstances that surround your birth should entitle you to nothing, uh, and and it should not entitle you to being um, you know suppressed from being able to uh, to uh, be able to take advantage of money. So with that being said. Um, I didn't really talk about this yet, but let's just define what money is, right? So, so money is really three things, right? It's it's a unit of account, um, it's a or excuse me, it's a transfer of value, a unit of account, uh, and a store of value. So, uh, so as long as we can store value, which we obviously can in Bitcoin, we can transfer value to another individual. We can always do obviously do that. And uh, we can keep a, a record or a balance of, of account balances, then we can obviously do that. So, so Bitcoin is in essence a cent decentralized money, and that's what we see. And it's done it now for um, ten years almost. So, uh, the so it's different from e gold. Um, you know, nobody can shut it down, and the value is uh, in the currency, and you, it can't be controlled by a government. So I kind of talked about that. Um, some interesting things to talk about here. Um, is uh, Satoshi actually um, mined his first Bitcoin block on January 3rd of 2009? Uh, and this little um, dot, this little uh, newspaper snippet that you guys see here, I'm going to talk about that actually a little bit long, a little bit here in just a second. Um, but I want to actually, I do want to talk about that just for a second. Um, what this newspaper is is you'll see it says Chancellor on the brink for the second bank bailout. And so um, this is a British newspaper, uh, and it was quoted um, in the message for the very first mined Bitcoin block. So when a miner went in and actually said, okay, here's a set of transactions on this, on this ledger, right? And I'm going to put something in here. So there's like a little note section over on the side. That's what he put in there. And I'm going to show that to you. I'm going to show that to you here in just a second when we take a look at a block explorer. But... Um, but when we did that, or when, when Satoshi did that, um, what happened was, is something that, it, you know, um, it might be been a, the fear of the government, um, or maybe um, there's some type of fiat fear where the government is bailing out the bank. So that's where a lot of libertarian type kind of types have kind of jumped on board to the Bitcoin bandwagon, and they've kind of uh, used this to kind of, um, um, as a sounding board for um, uh, their expression on how the money or the values that they have have been used um, in ways that they didn't they didn't approve of. So so there, you hear a lot of that. <clears throat> and so uh, also an interesting note about this newspaper um, is this actual newspaper is actually another way to kind of uh, I guess to kind of value uh, or use for the valuation of Bitcoin. Um, because actually in um, 2014, uh, in the uh, in Bitcoin Talk uh, news group, someone actually paid uh, almost a half a Bitcoin or 0.45 Bitcoin uh, for a copy of this newspaper. Uh, and so at the time, you know, you'll think, oh wow, 0.45 Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin's at you know 3,500 or whatever. Uh, that's 1,750 dollars. That's a lot of money. Well, not really, because at the time in 2014, it was 20 bucks, right? So. 
somebody still had valuation that this newspaper was worth 20 bucks back then and I'm not sure what it's selling for now on eBay but I'm sure you could go out and take a look <clears throat> all right so let's talk about kind of what's going on and with Satoshi and these first blocks so what I want to do is I want to kind of just take you guys out here and just kind of take you through um, btc.com if I go to btc.com, uh, I can go to the Block Explorer, and I really just want to kind of show you um, the blocks on Bitcoin. So if I come in here and I go to Blocks on this Block Explorer, what this does is, remember, what we're doing is we're looking at a ledger that has been going on since 2009. So let's let's talk about that. Let's see it. So here we're looking at, okay, here's the year, here's the month, here's the day. So I say I want to go back to 2009, and we said that it was January 3rd. Holy cow, there it is, January 3rd, the very first block. Let's see what happens. So we click on that, and then we come down here, and we see, okay, here is the very first block, block zero. Okay, so here is the Genesis block. Let's take a look at the Genesis block. We open up the Genesis block here. And let's see some information on this block. Now remember, um, when we look at uh, blocks that are a little bit more current, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at a grouping of transactions. So a block is a lot of things, but one of the things that are most important is it's a grouping of transactions, right? So let's go back and look at our little diagram here. Um, and so we see here, you know, we got all these transactions, and then we have a Coinbase, right? So the Coinbase is what I was saying earlier. That is the reward that goes to the miner. So the first one, nobody really got that, and so that one will never be spent. So that Coinbase is kind of locked there because um, it was just basically the, the first block that, that was set there by Satoshi. Uh, all other blocks would be mined by an individual. So Satoshi mined the second block, um, third, fourth, and fifth, so on and so forth. And then how got got involved. But let's look at some of the other things that were involved here. When we look at a block, it also has a nonce, a timestamp, a Merkle root, and the previous block's hash. Well, it won't have the previous block's hash here in this Genesis block. And let's go back and take a look at it. So when we come back here, we see for a, a few things. We see the block height is zero. Oh, let's talk about that. Block height is zero. Well, that means that if you have a block, set the block down, put another block on top of it, another block on top of it, I'm at what? Block three, right? So that's the block height. Block down here, let's see. Block down here, block zero. The first block is block zero. Block one, block two, block three, right? So that's how we go. You know, each block are uh, related to the block before it. So I think of Legos. You know, if you think about Legos, when you set a Lego block down at the bottom, it's kind of got those two things that stick up, and then you set the next one in, in, in top of it. Those two things that kind of stick up, those are kind of like the hash, right? Those are the hash of the previous block and then the hash of the next block that allows them to be strung together. And then this Merkle root thing is kind of like a hash that goes all the way back to zero, of just kind of like the headers. And it allows us to kind of just say, hey, this is how it's good all the way back to zero, or back to this Genesis block. So that's kind of just a general understanding of kind of how this stuff works. And hopefully that makes you guys uh, have a basic understanding of what you're seeing here. But you'll see this block height, uh, you know, there's a half a million confirmations. That means that a half a million witnesses have actually seen this transaction and said, yeah, that's good, and we're putting it on our chain as good. So once you have all these other people kind of saying, yeah, that's good, the more people you have or more confirmations that you have of other miners, then that means that, um, yeah, it's, it's probably a good transaction. And you can, you can take it to the bank or transfer it or whatever, whatever it is you need in order to value that that is a transaction that has met the level of valuation that's required. Um, the size of the block. Now, that's a big thing that you'll hear us talk about. We'll talk about that in a later discussion when I talk about the Bitcoin fork. Uh, and then um, also maybe I'll talk about that a little bit when I talk about Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin at SV and Bitcoin at ABC. I want to do some videos on that too. Um, so anyway, um, so anyway, let's talk about this real quick. The size of the block is 285 bytes. That was the first block there. Normally blocks are, are, are limited to one megabyte in size, and, and we'll talk that all about that, about that a lot more. Um, the strip size, this is a, um, we'll talk about segregated witness. This is where you're able to strip away the signatures. 
and and so we'll talk about that a little bit in a later um, in a later documentation. Uh, the version, uh, the difficulty that was used. Now, interestingly enough, what 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 I said earlier is I said that the miners are working on a math problem. Ha! Ah, what is this math problem? Hmm. Well, the math problem is simply they are trying to come up with a um, with a nonce that will give them a block hash. And so you notice this block hash off has all these leading zeros. What they have to do is they have this nonce right here. See this nonce? They have to come up with this random number to put into this equation that gives them a result that comes back to here. Now the interesting thing is, is that there's no way for them to really easily and quickly find out um, what that number is. They just have to guess. It's almost like you're um, you're you're trying to guess a uh, a lock, and you're just checking it, and that didn't work. And then you got to check it again, and that didn't work. And then you got to check it again, and you just keep checking the answers until finally the thing unlocks. So we've all done that, you know, back when in our in our early years, maybe we went through a padlock and tried different combinations until finally we got it to open, and then we thought we were a genius because we just simply uh, used what we call um, a brute force attack. In other words, we just simply kept trying different combinations until it worked. And that's what um, mining is doing, is it's just simply trying to uh, come up with a nonce number that meets the hardness requirement and then also come, gives us a result that gives us a hash of all of this data. So what is all of this data? What is a hash? What is a digest? Let's talk about that. So um, when you have a set of transactions, these transactions come into what's called the mempool. When they come into the mempool, that mempool then is going to be simply a grouping of transactions that the miner is going to put together, try to find a nonce with all this information using this equation that gives them a result of that block hash. It's a real hard math problem. It's a really, really hard math problem. And guess what? The math problem keeps getting harder because if, if a miner comes up with the answer in less than 10 minutes, then the math problem's not hard enough and it just continues to create a harder and harder math problem. And so that's called the difficulty, and that's what you see here. That's the difficulty level, that's the hardness, okay? And so what we're doing is we're just simply giving a, a, a network of computers, network of computers that are peer-to-peer -peer a math problem and saying, find the answer. And these computers go out and try to find the answer to this math problem and come back and say, I am it, I win. I mine the block. Why do we call this proof of work? Because it's work in math. It's math. It's a bunch of geeks saying, hey, my computer's faster than yours. Because guess what? Computers do math really good. Really, really good. Ah, clue, clue. This is starting to make sense, isn't it? All right. So um, anyway, I got, off my, I got off on a little tangent there. So that's a block explorer. Oh, let's go down here and take a look at this transaction real quick. Let's go take this. Check this out. This is awesome, isn't it? Da, 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 da. So check this out. We said it, said it. Let's see if we're right. Here it is. Chancellor on the brink of second bailout for banks. Boom. There it is. There's the input for that transaction, right? That was the input. That was the very first transaction on any blockchain. Bam. Right? Here's your outputs, right? So remember... This is going to be important. We'll talk about this in later lessons, but anytime that you're dealing with the digital ledger technology, we always have inputs and we always have outputs, and we always control those inputs and outputs. It's become really important when we start talking about Ethereum. All right, so um, so anyway, that's we'll, we'll talk about the scripts and some of the other things that are here. But again, the important thing is uh, the chancellor's on the bank for the second bank of the bailouts, and that's what I wanted you guys to see here and kind of get an understanding of what that meant. Okay, all right. So, um, so what happened is, is let's go back and talk about Satoshi and, and talk about what is it that Satoshi was doing. And so, um, you know, again, when we think about a distributed ledger, it's just a linked list, right? So it's a list of, hey, these are the transactions that I say that are good. They're in this block. Here's the transactions that you say that are good. They're in your block. And then we're just going to, boom, we're showing them to each other. And we're saying this is the set of transactions we're comparing uh, information amongst the peers. Uh, so, so how are these blocks linked together? As you guys saw that there was a hash 
and there was a signature and there was a Merkle root. So it's important for us to understand what is um, a digest, what is a hash, uh, and what is a hash algorithm, I guess, uh, what is a digest, uh, and what is source data. So let's just take a step away from Bitcoin for a second and not even think about Bitcoin for a second and just think about cryptography. In cryptography, we have the ability to take a set of data, any set of data of any size, and run it through a hashing algorithm and give ourselves a standard output. And that standard output normally is called a hash digest. And the algorithm that we send this through is called a hash. What does that do? Well, important things that this does for us is it ensures that if you have this hash digest and you look at the initial data set, if anything in that initial data set, even one character changes, then the hash digest would change as well and you would be able to prove that that file or that that source data has changed. Holy cannoli, Jeff Spicoli, that shit's badass. That means that I can make sure that you didn't change something. I can make sure that this was the status of information at this particular point in time in history. That's really cool and that's important. Um, so, you know, so, so, you know, if we can, you know, you just, just think about capturing that. All right. So, so these blocks are linked together by hash signatures and they're linked together by this Merkle root. Um, and so that's, that's again, that a signature, uh, is, is using this algorithm called asymmetric encryption. I want to talk about that real quick. Um, what that means is, is there's two sets of keys, a private key and a public key. There's a um, math algorithm between the private key and a public key that you can uh, not use the public key to find out what the private key is, but you can use the public key to verify anything that the private key has signed. I probably will need to do a class specifically on keys and signatures, so I'll do another class on that later. But basically, that's what that does. And so it's, um, it's in essence giving you the ability to ensure the validity of someone and that someone has something. And it also gives us the ability to provide what we call zero knowledge proofs. Um, and you might hear people talk about that, which is in essence your ability to prove something to someone without them having to know anything about what it is that you're using to prove that fact. Uh, so, so we'll talk more about that a little bit later on too. All right, so... Um, so that was a lot to cover there, but uh, again, the important things that I want you to kind of take away from this is that Satoshi started mining blocks, um, again, on January 3rd, 2009. Uh, we took a look at that first, uh, that first block. Those first blocks were rewarding 50 Coinbase or 50 blocks per block that was mined. Uh, there's 21 million blocks, uh, that can total, total blocks that can be mined based on this algorithm. Um, empty blocks uh, are basically um, what we see in most of the first blocks that were being mined because there was no transactions to be sent. In essence, it was just Satoshi uh, just proving that this math algorithm worked. He could prove how fast he could fix this uh, problem. He could come up with that knot. And then he started to get his friend involved, and that was Hal Finney. And so uh, Hal uh, got involved, and there's a picture of Hal here. Um, and so Hal got involved and he was the second miner. And so at this point, now it was kind of like a competition. It was Hal and Satoshi saying, hey, I can mine this block first. And then Satoshi saying, no, I can mine this block first. And then they were competing against one another. And then whoever uh, mined the block got the block reward, which was the coin base. And so initially, you know, it was just a proof of concept. It was just kind of um, a bunch of uh, theoretical thinking, people trying to figure out if they could figure out a way to transfer value from one location to another um, and, and, and do it through math, right? If we can just use math and hashing algorithms to do this and to establish secure identity uh, and establish who someone is, we can distribute this uh, across the network. And so that's kind of what we're looking at here. And so 
Bitcoin initially was worthless. You know, the first transaction where um, Hal and Satoshi were just kind of communicating between themselves uh, was uh, really just value valueless. It was just a proof of concept. Uh, that was actually done on January 12th of 2009. So if you go back to your Bitcoin Explorer, you'll be able to see kind of some of the um, some of the mines that, uh, excuse me, some of the blocks that were being mined by Hal and some that were being mined by Satoshi. And then you'll start to see some messaging going going uh, forth uh, on January 12th. So then they started to build the messaging protocol in. So now that not only do they have the ability to communicate uh, with the messaging, but they now have the ability to prove that, hey, my stuff is faster than yours. So we have the ability to come to a consensus that you were able to fix the math problem faster than I was. And here was the state of that problem at that particular time and all the transactions that we put in place in order to put that data there. So, so that's basically what we're doing, okay? All right, so um, again, uh, the, uh, the, the mining that we see here is just a, a linked list of, um, of, of, of blocks, of cryptographic blocks, and so that's what we see there. All right, so let's see here. Ready to move on. So what did that first block look like? Uh, we went in and just kind of did this already. I kind of showed this to you already. But again, you have your, this is actually the second block, not the first block, but this is the uh, second block. And if you'll notice here, this second block wasn't mined. And I, and I like to show this because we saw that the first block was mined on January 3rd. But look, it took another, um, you know, it, he didn't mine another block for another six days. So it was six days before he mined the next block. You know, so um, now we average about 10 minutes based on the hardness level and the size of the network and the hash power. But um, back then, you know, it took six days to mine that first block. So, um, so anyway, that's that's what was going on, and that was kind of the math algorithm, uh, and that's what we see here. All right, so um, anyway, let's go back and make sure I covered everything. So, 50 Bitcoin again are stuck in that first block. I did talk about that. I showed you guys the chancellor on the brink of the second bank bailout. We talked about how that might be kind of the, um, hey, I don't like fiat or something along those lines. All right, so with that being said, um, all of this mining that we're talking about and all this stuff that I've kind of been discussing is in this proof of work method is using what we call consensus uh, or we're coming up with call, what we call a consensus method. Since we are a distributed network of computers, we have to come up with a method that we can all come within agreement. Now, distributed consensus has actually been around since the 70s in avionics equipment, where they would have to ensure that they had failover on CPUs when they would hit atmospheric uh, interference and things along those lines. So it was important that, um, that we uh, had a method to ensure that multiple pieces of hardware could come into agreement and so proof of work was really one of the first times that this consensus method uh, was put into place to allow us to do that and it solved uh, this byzantine general problem that we've kind of been harping on for the last couple of lessons and so um, the way that it did this is in essence um, if, if, if I had two individuals, think about it like this. If I had two people and I took a dollar and I gave a dollar to that other person, the only thing that is uh, ensuring that I gave it to that other person is our word, right? And it's trust. It's trust that they believe it. It's trust that I believe it. And that's it. But if I had a witness that was standing there, then that witness could ensure that that transaction has taken place. However, it's possible if it's only one witness, I could bribe that witness, right? And say, hey, I'll give you 50 cents. Now we're both making out with 50 cents. Now he's gonna still owe me a dollar. Well, shoot, now we have a problem. But what if instead of having one witness or a single witness, what if I had 60,000 witnesses or a whole soccer stadium. I had I had Old Trafford, Manchester United and, and full of witnesses and they all saw me hand you that dollar. It would be really hard for me to go back and bribe all of those witnesses, wouldn't it? And so that's where proof of work really holds its value is it holds it from its ability 
to provide that it's nearly impossible to change this ledger uh, once the transactions have a certain height or a certain number of signatures or blocks stacked above it. And so that's in essence what the distributed consensus method does for us. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, all this technical stuff. Holy cannoli, Jeff Spicoli, you're wearing me out. My brain's hurting. We need to uh, get off of uh, get off of that for a second. Let's talk about some valuation for a second. So, um, you know, when we think about where Bitcoin first started to see value, a lot of people will recognize May twenty second, two thousand ten, as the day that Bitcoin really started to see value, because what happened was is that there was a developer in Florida that basically just posted onto a news group that said, hey, um, you know, we're all mining these Bitcoins and we're all kind of, you know, putting messaging back and forth. And uh, we're all just kind of trying to figure out what we should be able to do as far... Sorry, my dog is back there having a good time. Uh, so what we need to do is we want to we want somebody to send me two pizzas. And if you can send me two pizzas... Uh, I will send you 10,000 Bitcoin that I've been able to mine uh, on this network. And so uh, someone was able to provide those two pizzas to that individual. He transferred the, uh, the value from his uh, private keys uh, to the other individual's public keys, which gave the other individual uh, ownership of those Bitcoin. And then that gave the ability for us to transfer value across this network. So remember, what is money? It gives us the ability to, to um, have a unit of account and a transfer of value. So we just established that. We had an account and we transferred the value of that account. And now that other individual is able to store that value in the account. So we have money, digital money. Holy cannoli, Jeff Spicoli. This is amazing. So one month after somebody stole, or excuse me, after somebody stole, after somebody bought the two pizzas for the Bitcoin pizza guy, the valuation in one month, the valuation of Bitcoin went from eight tenths of a cent, and that's what it was there for that Bitcoin pizza purchase, to about eight cents in one month. So it gave us, why did, why did we get a 10x valuation in one month? That's crazy. So it gave us the anonymous transfer of money and value over the web of trust, keeping track of the inputs and the outputs of the previous Coinbase and transferring those funds to the new address. Wow, man, that is awesome. That's awesome. You guys like this stuff? All right, let me tell you another one. Check this out. Um, there's another one. Uh, there's actually, uh, on February 10th of 2011, this was a, another pretty funny one, um, and it kind of, uh, kind of brings a, around the uh, mascot of Bitcoin, which is the alpaca. And a lot of people are like, why is the alpaca and everything with Bitcoin? And I see it all over the place. Well, in 2011, February 10th, uh, Slashdot um, wrote an article um, about uh, um, you being able to buy uh, any type of object. You could even buy uh, with Bitcoin. You could even buy a pack of socks. So here, if you, if you go here, you can kind of see that what with that with that article um there was actually a website that was selling alpaca socks and they sold out in like a, a matter of minutes uh or hours or, or months it was it was really quickly um but but essentially what what we're seeing is is that you know we have a very good community that kind of uh is is very tribal actually and we we um we see that quite a bit so um so that 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 we'll talk about that a little bit here when we talk about uh mining pools and some of the uh, the nuances of where Bitcoin has been forked. And I'll talk about that probably tomorrow. And in, in tomorrow's lesson, we'll talk about Bitcoin Cash uh, and Bitcoin SV and how that fork came about. And I want to talk about hard forks and soft forks and what those are. Um, so anyway, uh, what miners are doing, again, is essentially they're just competing to get the next block. Um, and so, you know, they're proving that we have the ability to use this digital currency as money. It allows us to store value. It allows us as a medium of exchange and allows us to have a unit of account. Um, and, you know, did, did the pizza day move Bitcoin towards being a money? I think it did. I think it did. Cause in late 2010, uh, you know, the Bitcoin market cap was about $200,000, uh, um, 
And um, so, you know, now we know what it is today. You know, if we look at the market cap, it's, it's way much more than that. Um, one other thing of note, though, uh, there's been some trials and tribulations over the years. We, we need to talk about Mt. Gox and Silk Road, uh, some of the different articles that were released. Um, uh, for instance, like in late 2010, um, when, when the market cap was around 200000 um, the Financial Action Task Force actually issued a 117-page report on digital currencies um, and illicit activity and money laundering that was being used for payments and using it. Um, at that particular time, they had already shut down eGold, uh, and, um, but BIC and, and PayPal was still being used for, is obviously still being used for settlements, but as far as digital currency is concerned, um, they didn't mention Bitcoin specifically by name, but it was pretty pretty obvious that that's that's kind of what they were they were hinting at. So, so you know, there's always been this fun dance, you know, with authorities and and, and the market, and, and we're just simply trying to find a way for this to really work for everyone. I think is what the what the market's trying to do. So, really, the ultimate thing that I want you guys to take away from the the valuation that you see here from the Bitcoin Pizza Day is that Bitcoin gave us the ability to move wealth and it gave us the ability to do this quickly. We could do it in a decentralized manner. Um, it also allows us to inspire other technologies that could be built on top of this. Um, and it creates other value, value propositions and other verticals that we may not even be thinking of today. Um, we haven't even, may not even tapped into those in some of the crazy white paper utility tokens that have been sent out over the last year. So. Um, so anyway, hopefully everybody kind of understands this concept uh, and this makes sense. All right, so Mt. Gox. Let's talk about Mt. Gox for a second. Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. So Bitcoin's first exchange um, was uh, basically, um, there used to be a card game called Magic the Gathering, uh, a card game. And in order for them to trade cards, there was a developer that created a exchange online that allowed them to do that. And um, they actually used that same exchange and that same underlying software uh, to build out the ability to exchange Bitcoin and Bitcoin transactions. Actually, 70% of all transactions were on Mt. Gox back in 2010. And it ran great up until 2013 when it collapsed and it caused the, basically the death of Bitcoin. Um, and simply, quite simply, it's, uh, it, it, it was basically, uh, you know, 850,000 Bitcoin that was belonged to customers in Mt. Gox um, were stolen, were most likely stolen or missing. And it was because of the private keys. Uh, were not kept uh, were kept in the hot on the exchange and um, so um, you know the the uh, the exchange kind of brought it down it was the major place to exchange Bitcoin uh, the collapse caused uh, basically a Bitcoin death um, you know it, it basically took Bitcoin from 1200 uh, down to 200 uh, and it stabilized right around there uh, and, it, and it took really about two years before the prices started to kind of come back. Um, and a lot, of a lot of people thought that Mt. Gox, that this, this exchange, because everybody's value was basically stolen from them. It was like a, you know, they, they, everybody had all of their stuff in this exchange to, to do everything, and then the exchange went down. So imagine, you know, they robbed the train, you know, that was being used to, to do all the transactions. So. So the so everybody kind of had to take a step back and, and reevaluate. Um, so a couple of other problems that I really didn't talk about, um, but I think this isn't necessarily a problem. It's probably something that we need to probably um, pay attention to because it's really more of an accolade to speak to the core development team of volunteers that work on uh, Bitcoin Core uh, on August tenth. Or excuse me, in August of 2010, um, there it was discovered in block number, and, and here you can actually take a look at this. Um, this is actually the article, uh, the, but it was called the value overflow incident. And in essence, what this did, and if we go out and look at that block number in our block explorer 74638, uh, we could see that that transaction was actually able to create instead of 50 bitcoins for their outputs, 
um, it was actually um, able to create billions and billions of Bitcoin, uh, 184 billion Bitcoin, it looks like here, uh, for three different addresses. And that was a problem, right? So how did they, how were they able to find a flaw in the code that was able to do this? So it was obviously a flaw in the code, but the problem is, is we're running a distributed network, a distributed ledger that's across multiple machines that needs to be hot fixed. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, kind of what that means from a development standpoint, um, I would make the comparison that this is like trying to fix a jetliner in mid-flight. Uh, it's very, very difficult. And so the developers were able to come together uh, and do what we called a hot fix and fix the problem and fix that running software. Um, and all of those extra coins that were mined were simply orphaned and the chain that had those invalid coins uh, was no longer valid and the chain continued on as, as expected. But what this did is it showed the resilience of the team at that time and it showed their ability to quickly fix problems uh, and hot fix problems as needed um, and uh, really lots of accolades for the team. Um, now, another thing of note though is that just one month after this incident, um, that was when Bitcoin uh, mining pool started and I don't think Satoshi really had and that's what we talk about here is I don't think Satoshi really had mining pools um, in mind whenever he wrote the white paper because really when we when Satoshi really wrote the paper the thought was one CPU one vote and so the really starts to be this huge contention with these miners because they're all competing they all want the most hashing power. And so we've seen all kinds of reports where scientists are using, you know, uh, computers in the laboratory to mine Bitcoin and things of that nature. Um, but the reality is, is that the, the, they started with the CPUs and then GPUs and then the ASICs mining or Applis application specific uh, instruction circuits, uh, I believe is what that stands for. Um, but basically what they did is they burned the hashing algorithm. Remember the hash, that, that math that they got to do? Well, instead of a computer having the ability to do a lot of different things, they just burned the math into the computer and said, this is the only thing you're going to do, and you're going to do it really freaking fast. And that's what an ASICS computer is. And so that's what the mining rigs are doing now is um, they've just been kind of um, pooled together. And so, so one person uh, being able to sit down and, and, and mine Bitcoin uh, off their laptop is almost impossible these days with what's going on. And so there's a, there's been a lot of uh, proposals on how we can fix this problem. Um, but mining pools obviously is starting to put centralization, I guess, a little bit into the mine, into mining processes because um, in essence, you're really just playing a lottery against uh, someone that owns most of the lottery tickets. Uh, so, so it's pretty tough. And I'll talk more about that when we talk about Bitmain and some of the other um, people that are producing these ASICs uh, mining rigs. And we'll talk about why that that's, tends to be a problem. Um, all right, uh, let's see here. Um, so another thing too to note about this is this brings into note uh, consensus methods. So I wanna talk about the proof of work consensus method uh, a little bit more. When we think about proof of work, that means that we don't trust anybody else on the network. There's no trust. And we need to have that trust. And the only way to do that is through this mining mechanism. There's other consensus method mechanisms that have been proposed that allow you to put some trust in place based on some other type of mechanism like proof of something. So proof that you have staked something or proof that you have burned something or proof that you own something or proof that something about you exists. Um, but those, again, are really putting trust uh, in place in order for you to be able to mine. So keep that in mind when you start thinking about proof of work versus proof of stake and some of the other algorithms that you see out there. Um, all right. So 
anyways, so that's that's good. Oh, one other thing of note is is so when we think about Bitcoin and we think about how often our Bitcoin uh, blocks mined, Bitcoin blocks are mined every 10 minutes. And, and and how does that happen? Well, the hardness level that I showed you guys earlier when we were looking at the block explorer, that hardness level is evaluated every so often and it just makes the math problem harder for the miners, right? Or easier for the miners, depending on how long it's taken those miners to mine blocks. And so on average, um, it just needs to take about 10 minutes. And if it doesn't take 10 minutes, then it'll make it harder. Or if it uh, is taking more than 10 minutes, then it'll make, to make it easier. So in essence, that's uh, the hardness level that we saw back when we were looking at the block explorer. All right, so hopefully that makes sense. All right, so let's go back, let's go to our next slide here. So I wanna talk a little bit about Silk Road um, and the illicit side of Bitcoin and talk about that because we did talk about it yesterday. Um, you know, don't let your morality get in, in the way of innovation. Uh, and I do want to talk about that here a little bit with the Silk Road. So if you're not familiar with the Silk Road, um, many times people will cite Silk Road and its illicit activity uh, being tethered to Bitcoin somehow. And I want to make sure that I point out that there is distinct separation between them. Silk Road was an online marketplace that allowed you to buy and sell illicit uh, drugs, activity, all these things. And you see a picture of it up here. Uh, just anything that you wanted. It was a place for people to do things um, illicitly, right? And, and so, um, so in that, the payments were used to purchase some of this illicit activity were being done using Bitcoin. And so therefore, a lot of people will tether Bitcoin to that product. It is not that product, and it has never been that product. It is simply the way that that product has used uh, in order to pay things. Now, one of the interesting products that did come out of Silk Road is they found that if someone was paying for transactions on Silk Road, they could then track those transactions and uh, we could define that that was uh, coming from, uh, you know, illicit source and then we could, you know, just make that an invalid Bitcoin. But what Silk Road was able to do is they were able to use what's called a tumbling method uh, within their environment that would just basically mix and provide anonymity to all of these different blockchain inputs so that it was um, unidentifiable uh, to be able to find out where the tainted cryptocurrencies funds actually ended up. So it obfuscates the data so much so that you can never really trans uh, figure out where the funds originated from. Um, and so that technology gave a lot of anonymity to the Bitcoin product, which would allow an individual to be able to send money to anyone for any reason, any time. Um, and so that was a benefit. You may not like what it was being used for, but don't hate the technology for why it's being used because that's pretty cool. Um, so if you think about if you wanted to, if you had, for instance, um, uh, a relative that was in, um, uh, I don't know, a, uh, in, in South Korea or something, uh, in, um, or excuse me, in yeah, North Korea. Uh, if, if, you had, if you had a relative that was in a nation state that was in turmoil and you needed to send them money through Western Union, many times you're not able to do that. You can do it through Bitcoin, but if you do it through Bitcoin and you use trace, track and traceability, it's very possible you might have somebody knocking on your door saying, why are you sending money to this, this region of the world that has turmoil? So, um, so uh, maybe a, t a tumbler might help you um, to be able to, um, to send money to your relatives and support them. Um, but, but definitely, um, you know, obviously with any good technology, it'll be used for bad things too. So, you know, hey, I, I'm a Marine uh, and, and I love my Marine brothers and sisters and I absolutely wouldn't hate to see uh, this be used for terrorist methods and things like that. So, so you know, good comes with bad and, and you know, we just have to be aware of the tool. Um, so don't hate the tool, just hate how it's being used. Um, but I think that with Bitcoin, with Litecoin, with our ability to transfer value, store value, maintain value, in a digital marketplace like this, uh, it will allow us to um, adopt this in much better methods. And so we can be more the sheriff uh, helping people um, 
improve their lifestyles uh, and not uh, the cowboy trying to step on people's head and keep them down. And hopefully everybody uh, takes that initiative uh, when we, as we look at these technologies. All right. So don't hate the tool, just hate how it's being used. So again, um, you know, one of the big things too that we saw is, you know, retailers like Dell, Overstock.com, um, BitPay, Coinbase, uh, Bitfinex, uh, um, uh, Bitrix. Uh, you, you see a lot of uh, successful um, real industries being built today. So I said this before, be a sheriff, not a cowboy. Um, you know, one of the things that we see, you know, with the, the change in mood from 2014 to today, especially with the Silk Road debacle, is, you know, the Deloitte execs uh, in 2014, one thing, one Deloitte exec said that everything that Bitcoin is involved in had to do with drugs. But if you look at some of the initiatives that are put forth by the leaders at Deloitte, uh, they have a lot of blockchain initiatives, a lot of Bitcoin initiatives to do things with track and traceability and supply chain and a lot of different verticals that are taking advantage of this technology. So um, we're slowly recognizing the value of the market. Why is it working in this marketplace? Uh, what good comes from it? How can it be used in other ways uh, for, for good things? You know, what other things can we use this for um, and how can we you know, pay back to the environment? Um, because this gives control back to the owner. It removes centralized control. Um, and it's really the absolute primary use case for us to be able to have digital money. I mean, I think that's probably what, what Bitcoin proved. Uh, and it allows limits, limitless what boundaries. I mean, we have so many things that we need to explore that still haven't even been looked at uh, with this technology. And we really need to explore all of these. And, um, and, and we just have to ensure that we do it the right way. So let's, uh, let's, let's have a little bit more fun here. And we'll talk a little bit about who some of the usual suspects are uh, for being Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people think that it's just a group of people that were working together and they put this product together because, you know, when, when Bitcoin was actually released, it was actually a full scaled product. You could kind of just push button mining. It didn't take a whole lot in order to get a mining rig up and running. Um, and it was really a full suite of a, of, of a, of a product that allowed uh, everything that was needed. It would be really hard for one individual to undertake um, and be able to publish that much of a software suite by themselves. So, um, so I think it probably was a group of individuals, but if you wanted to point your finger at one person, some of the usual suspects that we've seen over the years, and I'll just touch on these briefly, uh, Dorian Nakamoto, this poor man, simply had the last name Nakamoto, was a computer scientist, had a little bit of a libertarian background, um, was really good at math, uh, and lived in, in California, and, and um, I think Newsweek uh, wrote an article about they found Satoshi, and they pointed the finger at this guy, and, and uh, in came the media hounds, and just completely destroyed this poor man's life. So uh, the fact that people think that he is Satoshi uh, is is pretty crappy because during all of this, he had actually lost his job, couldn't even pay for his internet. And I don't think that somebody that controlled billions of dollars uh, would, would allow themselves to have that type of poverty. So, uh, and then Craig, Craig Stephen Wright, um, he's been in the project for a long time, uh, but he's claimed to be Satoshi. Uh, there was a meeting of him and Gavin Andreessen, and I'll talk about Gavin here in just a second, uh, where he supposedly provided the keys to the Satoshi, um, uh, the Satoshi wallets, uh, and uh, but there was some questionability from Gavin on whether the validity of those keys were proven, um, and he's not yet tr done that again. So, so anyway, uh, that's that's him. Nick Zabo, I talked about Nick yesterday, and I'll talk about him more when we get into smart contracts, but. He's really uh, been, in, been an essential part of a lot of these projects. Uh, he's also um, kind of the grandfather of the smart contract. Um, and so he kind of helped bring that around. And so a lot of people think, and he, he vehemently disagrees that he's Satoshi anytime somebody points a finger at him. So a lot of people think that it might be him or he might be a part of the team. And then Gavin Andreessen, and, and I already mentioned Hal Finney, uh, Hal, of course, because Hal was the uh, one of the first miners, uh, and he had kind of a unique writing style, and a lot of his code uh, is is kind of quirky a little bit, 
matches to Satoshi's code. Uh, and then Gavin Andreessen as well, because he was actually the guy that Satoshi handed the keys over to uh, when he walked away. So one other thing to note uh, is Satoshi actually, the, one of the last messages that he sent is he actually did uh, come in uh, online and sign in the message digitally uh, saying, I am not Dorian Nakamoto. So that a lot of people are like, holy cow, maybe that means that he is him. So uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's him. So, so anyway, that's, I think it's kind of fun. I think it's kind of fun to talk about that. That stuff that makes it interesting. So one last thing that I want to talk about is, you know, when we think about a lot of these guys, and a lot of these guys are volunteers that work on these open source projects. And so I wanted to touch a little bit about what open source is um, and why blockchains are considered open source many times and some of them are not. Uh, but open source software means just that. It means that it's openly available. Um, and uh, it's open for public view. Anyone can audit it. Anyone can submit improvements. Anyone can work on it. Anyone can take it and start working on their own stuff or fork it. Uh, and so we'll talk about a hard fork later on. I'll talk about that tomorrow. But blockchains don't have to be open source. A lot of times they are today, but they don't have to be. Um, there are a lot of closed source systems in there, uh, out there, but they tend to be more centralized, and they tend to remove that centralized feel of a blockchain. So the confined knowledge to a team, uh, the proprietary information uh, is, is, is their security. Uh, and so, you know, it does give you some market advantages, um, allows you to conceal a lot of your bugs. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a limited source for your commits and a limited source for your resources. And so, you know, there's good and bad to, to both sides of closed source and open source software. Um, so... One of the things about open source is it does operate in full public view. So, you know, anybody can audit it. Anybody can submit improvements. Disadvantage uh, for an open financial system uh, is, it, um, is, you know, a lot of times people don't want to share their financials on uh, a public chain. So uh, many enterprises just can't adopt this. So they need something similar but different, right? Um, and so there's projects out there that are private chains, uh, and there's also projects out there that are, um, um, taking their private data and then interchaining it uh, or side chaining it or um, communicating with another chain however they decide to frame that up uh, there's some projects that are out there doing that and I want to talk about that in some later lessons um, but uh, but anyway uh, so the market disadvantage um, is you know again with the open financial systems that's just not not really feasible a lot of times and so um, there's a lot of developers out there in the open market that are doing this kind of as a volunteer because they've kind of made enough money to be able to pay their regular bills. And so they're doing this as a passion. Uh, a good example of this would be Vidalic Buterin. Um, in early 2016, uh, his holdings estimated at about $200,000. Um, and then February of 2017 is about $25 million. Uh, and he's a he's a volunteer. You know, if you uh, if you look at his history, he's volunteering on these projects. So uh, if you have that net worth, then you can probably do that. So hopefully um, we can all find that at some point. All right. So um, and then again, these these volunteers are, are going to be heavily incentivized to fix problems quickly. Uh, and um, they have a strong record of doing that. And that's what we saw with fixing the, uh, you know, fixing the jet airline in flight. So I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Again, I just wanted to introduce you to Bitcoin. I wanted to take about an hour and I went over about 10 minutes. So I apologize for that. I hope that this was easily digestible and you guys were able to understand what Bitcoin is, how it works. I encourage you to go out there and look at a block explorer, look at some transactions, look at what's going on in transactions, look at some public addresses, um, look at some transaction signatures. Um, look at some proofs uh, and, and, and check it, check that out. I mean, I really think by actually looking at the ledger using that btc.com uh, and actually looking at, you know, looking at what you see here, uh, you know, in these transactions, looking at what's going on, this will really become helpful for you. In our next lessons, I think we're going to be talking about some of the scalability that we see on public networks and layering. Um, and I also want to get a little bit more involved in some of the verticals where we'll see some of this technology take place. I hope you've enjoyed this training video. As I said before, I am trying to make a series of these. I'm doing these completely on a volunteer basis, so I would appreciate any um, donations. There's my Ethereum address, and I will 
helplessly grovel for your donations. Um, so again, in this lesson, we introduce you to Bitcoin. We talk about the first implementations. Of the, it's the first implementation of a blockchain or a digital money um, that's decentralized. Uh, we talked about mining. We talked about Hal and Satoshi. We talked about where Satoshi might come from. Uh, we looked at the blocks. We looked at why blocks work. We looked at why mining works. Uh, we talked about the math. We talked about the hardness. We talked about the, the knots. Um, we talked about the Bitcoin pizza day. We talked about Mt. Gox. We talked about some of the valuation fluctuation and liquidity that we've seen in Bitcoin over the years and why we've seen that. Uh, and we've also been able to look at a little bit about who Satoshi was. And so I hope I've been, make, been able to make this entertaining for you. If you ever need a Bitcoin trainer, if you ever just need me to talk to you, reach out to me, Tommy Cooksey, T. Cooksey1972 at Gmail. I look forward to hearing from you. Give me a thumbs up, subscribe. I hope to be producing more of these every day. Thanks and have a great day.